a list of uh, you'll find a list of those sermons. All right, so we have a uh, part thirty-eight. Oh my goodness, part thirty-eight <laughs> of uh, our study on the Book of Revelation, and again, just understanding apocalyptic literature. Uh, we are definitely going to uh, go on to chapter 14 today. How much of it we actually read today? If we can get through the first five verses, then I will consider that an accomplishment. But uh, uh, but I want us to remember our very important discussion that we've been having the last two, three weeks uh, regarding our recognition of, uh, um, of the Antichrist, understanding the Flip that to way so you can see it a little bit. There you go. Uh, our understanding of the Antichrist, and and in that, our our goal in this study has not been to figure out who is the Antichrist or what is or who who is the Antichrist, whether it is past, present, future, none of that. That's really not the aim of what John is trying to do in the Book of uh, Revelation. What is more important, not only in Revelation, but also as we looked at some of the other passages where it talks about the lawless one and the Antichrist, and even Jesus himself said it in Matthew chapter 24, that the spirit has already gone out into the world, and that there are already Antichrist out there now, and that we have to be able to recognize the difference between the two. Now, as we get into chapter 14, we will see some of the same repeated imagery that we've come across in earlier portions of the book of Revelation. Um, um, you know, again, we should be familiar with these things in our you know, previous studies. Uh, it should not hopefully be as difficult this time around as we look at some of that uh, imagery. But uh, remember that a picture is worth a thousand words. You know, and that's really is characteristic of apocalyptic literature. It is a style of writing, just like um, comedy is a is a style of writing, comedic, you know, uh, rhetoric, or uh, just like romance is a type of literature novel, just like uh, horror films or horror is a type of genre. Apocalyptic literature is a type of genre, and so that you read it through a certain lens. Uh, Many times what we often see with apocalyptic literature, the image themselves that is being used is not the actual message, but these images represents other things. Uh, one of the difficulties, you know, certainly I went, witnessed as I, you know, am studying uh, the book of Revelation and presenting it to you is that, you know, certainly I believe well-meaning brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and again, just because I disagree with a person theologically as it relates to the book of Revelation does not mean that a person is not my brother or sister in Christ. Um, but, but I have seen, you know, again, well-meaning people uh, really get lost in their interpretive thought as they approach the book of Revelations. Uh, sp specifically those dispensational brothers and sisters. And when I say dispensational, um, dispensational basically is a, is a theological interpretive thought that really looks at the Bible in its most literal sense. So literally um, in chapter 11, where it's talking about those two witnesses that I mentioned, uh, it says that they uh, will breathe fire out of their mouths. And dispensationalism, as it approaches the Bible, it, it literally interprets that in this most literal sense, that literally they believe that God is going to give to the world two prophets in the end times, that this will literally be what they are able to do, that those enemies of these two uh, prophets, of these two prophets will literally be consumed with fire from their breath. Um one, one dear brother I was watching on YouTube uh, this this past week, uh, because again, you know, as I'm searching and doing my studying and, and stuff of this uh, on Google and online, you know, my algorithm, even in YouTube, delivers me videos about the book of Revelation and interpreting thoughts from other, you know, denominations and stuff like that. And so one preacher who had a really cool accent uh, was speaking and, you know, this is literally the picture that he's painting. He said, this is what it's going to be. Now, the church, according to him, is safely tucked away in heaven before these two, you know, fire-breathing prophets uh, come along. But, um, and, he, and he goes on to say in his sermon that, you know, 
you can't spiritualize these two prophets that are able to breathe fire. It's an actual thing. And I kind of chuckled when he said that, not, not simply because I disagree with him, but because in the next line of Revelation chapter 11, where he was reading, it talks about um, the city where our Lord and Savior, uh, it, it talks about the great city. That's what it says, the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Gomorrah and the place where our Lord and Savior was crucified. So literally, He's saying you can't spiritualize these images, but then the book of Revelation itself literally says, hey, this is a spiritual Sodom and Gomorrah, which is, you know, the place where Jesus crucified that great city, which is Jerusalem. So, you know, again, I kind of I kind of chuckled when he said that, you know, because, again, he just kind of kind of ran past that particular point. But I, I think to deny the mystical and allegorical and metaphoric sense of an apocalypse of the apocalyptic literature is, is really to take a T-bone steak, take off the little filet part, the most tender part of it, and then take the, the KC strip or the strip portion off and throw it away and just keep the bone. That's, that's literally what we're doing when we're saying we're not supposed to interpret this, these images as somehow um, you know, pointing to some other reality, uh, but that the pictures themselves are the reality of themselves. Now, again, a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, and again, that, that that's an adage that helps us to understand that meaning, that even complex, that sometimes complex meanings, meanings uh, can embody, multi, can be embodied in a way, excuse me, ah, I'm tongue twisted here, that a pic, um, the adage is, that complex and sometimes multiple ideas can be conveyed in a st single still image is what I'm trying to say. Um, again, we, we've looked at a bunch of images over our time. Again, even this particular image is right, right here of this man breathing fire. Contextually, if we change the context of this particular image, say this particular image is found on the bottle of a bottle of hot sauce. Well, breathing fire would mean that, hey, the sauce is hot. Uh, you know, not literally that you will breathe fire by adding this to your, to your fish and chicken. Or if we found this particular, um, you know, image in a, um, say, a, um, a dental office and the dentist poster is saying, hey, you know, you want to make sure that you floss and, you know, do all these other dental hygiene things or, you know, this will be your breath. Uh, again, the context changes even though we're using the same picture and image. Context matters in that way. Um, if this was a, uh, you know, on a placard for a rap battle, you know, well, that would mean this person here is spitting hot fire, meaning that they can rap, they have bars, you know. Hey, I mean, but again, this is how we have to approach the Bible. It's just simply taking this the Bible it, at its most literalistic level. It's not always going to yield the best interpretation or what that author was trying to convey to his particular audience. Now, John is about to revisit. I say all that to say that John is about to revisit some of the images that we have seen earlier on, actually a few different times earlier on in the book of uh, Revelation. Uh, and, and, and a lot of it has to do with the church. And so we're going to see that coming up here. But first, real quick review uh, from last week. We looked at all these words. And now that these words are, are special in any particular sense of themselves, but we did this exercise where I wanted us to understand the difference between uh, what is the spirit of Antichrist and what is the spirit of Christ. Now, many times when it comes to the Antichrist, he is going to, or the spirit of Antichrist and how it works, all the same words that we find here under Christ are also found under Antichrist. And let me just point this out real quick. For the last two, three weeks, I did not notice that I had the word, the wrong verses on, uh, on the page. Uh, literally, I had verses as far as a verse of scripture, not V-E-R-S-U-S. And none of you all pointed that out, so... Um, I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, but I finally got it right here. So I'm sure there'll be other typos somewhere. But nonetheless, um, I got it corrected on this particular side. Three weeks later, I've been rocking with verses like the spirit of Christ versus and the spirit of Antichrist versus. So anyway, 
Um, but again, we, we see all these same terms as far as love, peace, power, anointing, through the spirit. You have an antichrist version of those things. Again, what true love is, is not the same thing as the counterfeit version of, of, of love. And this is what the antichrist, the spirit of antichrist works within. Um, um, we have to be able to recognize the, the counterfeit. We have to be able to recognize the parody. We have to be able to recognize uh, the, the fake version of love and the fake version of peace and power and what fake leadership are, are, are um, um, what's the way to say it? Um, what, again, just because a person has the title of pastor, does not make them a pastor. Again, you have people who call people pastor that are now that pastor is in jail because of, you know, embezzlement or they are serving time because they have sexually, you know, assaulted and molested a child in the church or, or, or something, some other egregious act, you know? So, so it has to be more than just titles. Again, what's, what's inside? of all these things. And if we're spending all our time trying to figure out and calculate, well, who is the Antichrist as opposed to what is Antichrist, then, then we are doing ourselves in the body of Christ in the time that we live a great disservice. Again, we shouldn't get caught up in a who Antichrist, but what is, because that spirit we're told is already prevalent in, in the world. And right now, as we looked at this example uh, last week, um, was and, I, and I'll play it again this week uh, because I need to make sure I mute my audio because it kept breaking up in the on the re-recording. But uh, we looked at this video last week and um, I asked if this exact was an example of the gospel. Was what this lady is about to do in this video? Of course, you all are familiar with this video since we spent a number of time with it last week. It's only a minute or so long, so I'll play it again. But what she, what what she did was it really truth? Was it a profile in in godly passion and courage. And, you know, and, and in the end, we all determined that in all points that, no, this was not the gospel. This is not courage. This is not godly passion. But let's watch it again just for, you know, so I can get a clean recording of it as well. celebrates the seventh Texas Muslim Capital Day. We are honored, thank you. I proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ over the capital of Texas. I stand against Islam and the false prophet Muhammad. Islam will never dominate the United States, and by the grace of God, it will not dominate Texas. I like that. I like that. I like that. I like that. It's okay. It's okay. So that was the video we looked at last week. And of course, you know, the explanation at the, to the people there from, I guess, from one of the supporters of uh, Miss uh, Christine Weick, uh, go home, you know. Um, again, and, and let me just reinforce this. Again, we don't have time to really discuss it again, but in no point in this video is what Christine Weick did. Is it the gospel? Absolutely not. Was it a profile in Christian courage and passion? No, it was deception. She has, you know, donned a, a shirt with a um, and a 
a, a Arabic symbol to, you know, to be kind of blend in with the day and then to bogart her way to the podium, snatching the mic from the woman who was talking. This was a Muslim capital day. Again, you can look at the video from last week to hear a little bit more of the background. But this is not how we as believers are told to minister the gospel. We don't have to be tacky. We don't have to be brutes. Um, and again, notice her, her nationalistic gospel. It was about the Islam not dominating Texas, the state of Texas, and uh, this uh, nationalistic gospel of the United States. Uh, and it just happened to have the name of Jesus on top of it. So this was, you know, as we looked at some of those words from last uh, week, this this had to do with deception. It was a lot of, uh, you know, nationalistic propaganda in it. Uh, this is not the gospel message that we should be uh, teaching, you know. Uh, the Bible is not trying to prevent Islam from taking over the United States of America. You know, uh, you know, people may consider her patriotic, but the Bible is not calling us to be patriotic in the same sense of the word, uh, at least not to America, but, you know, to the kingdom of God. Um, it, it does not sound like to me that this woman finds her citizenship in heaven. Our citizenship is with God. It is in the abode of God. Uh, um, it does not sound like she is a living in a land where she herself is considered a foreigner uh, or an ambassador of the kingdom of God. But it sounds like she is an ambassador for a kind of nationalistic Texas or a kind of, um, you know, this manifest destiny America, you know, policy, so to speak. How does her attitude remotely, uh, even remotely resemble the gospel other than the fact that she says in the name of the Lord Jesus? Again, even the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, it will traffic in all the same terminologies and terms that, that we may hear in church or, or in the body of Christ. But again, how those things are manifested determines whether it is the spirit. Again, I didn't correct spirit on this slide. So and you guys did point that out last week. <laughs> uh, my goodness. Um, but but. We have read in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, um, about this uh, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilingual army that follows the slain lamb. How can we hold an amor parte, and amor parte basically just means love of country, uh, to where we see other cultures as in other peoples as threats to our way of life versus you know our desire and the mandate to go out into all the world and teach the gospel to all nations baptizing them in the name of the father son and the holy spirit and lo i am with you always until the end how how does this a more parte that christine week has how does it you think it affects her her evangelism <laughs> What she did on the stage, she thinks that's evangelism. But who is that going to win? Who was that? Who applauded that? But other nationalistic people that agree with her already. That is precisely what is wrong in many ways with what we see in the church in America today, in, in our understanding of the Book of Revelation. When it comes to that 144,000 that, again, the Bible keeps saying is a multi-ethnic, multi-national, uh, multi-lingual uh, people of God, as I, I would say as people like Christine Week, you know, the woman that just snatched the microphone, as they often interpret that 144,000, they don't see it as a people, a total people of God but it's often cut off in that, and again, this is what happens in dispensational theology or dispensationalism, uh, which is very popular in America, is that the 144,000 are really not part of the church. 
Because in their in not that understand in their understanding, the church at this point is already gone and safely tucked away in heaven. It has the church has been raptured, and so this hundred and forty four thousand are those who are left behind. So these 144, they do come to know Jesus, 144,000 people believe they do come to know Jesus, but the first family or the first group, the first, the real deal, holy field people of God, so to speak, again, we're already gone or whoever they believe that is is already gone and they are included in that number already gone. And so this 144 are just left to kind of go through the most terrible time in all of human history. You know, they have to go through the big trouble in Little China, so to speak. Anybody remember that movie? Heard Russell? But but let me ask you this. As it relates to family, how many of you are willing right now to leave your family behind? And for some of you, I know that word, that's a foreign concept, and that it may be sacrilegious or even blasphemous to say leaving your family behind. For other people, depending on your concept of family, you may say, yeah, I can't stand my family anyway, so, you know, whatever. But when I say family, I'm not talking about those who simply share DNA with you. I'm not talking about family in the sense of someone who simply has the same last name or that you share a, you know, paternal or maternal grandparent or, you know, family member. When, when I'm talking about family, I'm talking family are those you have community with. You have commonality. You have even stronger word than commonality. You have a communion with. You have a, the Greek word would be koinonia or fellowship. You laugh, you can cry, you support, you lean upon. How many of you would be willing just to? Say, hey, you know, drop and leave that all behind. My wife and I, uh, <clears throat> this last week, uh, as we were, uh, you know, looking at the uh, lottery going up to 1.7 billion or 1.23 billion, whatever it is, over a billion dollars of the lottery. You know, we we were literally discussing as we would, you know, be in the car, just sitting around the house, watching TV or commercial come on, um, you know, how we would take care of our families if we were to win in and be able to take the lump sum, because we taking the lump sum if we ever, you know, win the lottery. Uh, uh, we would think it was 600 something, 620 something million, you know, so we were literally discussing, okay, how we would take care of our, our families, uh, you know, with that particular money. Uh, and in that entire discussion, I have to admit that neither one of us, uh, you know, saw time to actually go and buy an actual ticket. You know, she asked me, I bought a ticket. I'm asking, did you go get a ticket? No, I ain't get no ticket. I didn't know what the drawing was. I get one on Friday. I get one next week. Okay. And all of a sudden now, come Friday, the money gone. So uh, sorry, family, that's out the window, but we thought about blessing you. Anyway, uh, when we talk about family, it is those that you can't be easily pried from. But when people like Christian Weir, potentially as they look at this 144,000, as they see them as something as other, they don't see them as part of the entire family of God because that's their theology. I'm gone. I'm out. I got mine. I hope you got yours. But that's not a family concept. Not only is was her, again, her presentation of the gospel room, she and others that hold this kind of view of the 144,000, they really have a faulty understanding of what um, in theology we call ecclesiology. Ecclesia meaning church. So ecclesiology is the study of the church or the theology of the church. So they not only have an ecclesiology issue, they also have an eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the end things or theology of the end. All this is, is really a, an amalgamation of what the Bible is actually trying to teach about these things. This 144,000, which is going to come up in the very first verse of chapter 14, again, is another picture of the people of God. And, and, and as it is codified now, or you know, best explained now in this day as the church, Again, 12 times 12 is 144. Of course, you know, you can start with those 12 tribes, so to speak, and those faithful people under the, 
the, the, you know, the first covenant, you know, to God. And then, of course, what we have built upon by the, uh, you know, the 12 apostles in the New Testament. Again, this is the people of God. This is a picture of the people of God. Again, it's made up of, of all types of people, not just white people, not just Americans, not just black people, but it is a it, it, it is a multi-ethnic, multilingual, multicultural uh, people. It is, it is from everywhere. And, I, and I'm actually supposed to be taking a class in uh, coming up on ecclesiology and eschatology uh, at the college. So I don't know if it'd be this semester, but I'm looking forward to it. Again, because I'm, I'm looking forward just to getting those new resources to see, you know, kind of how the college, you know, kind of teaches these particular things. Of course, I have my own thoughts on it now. But again, as it relates to church, it does seem we treat our churches, you know, certainly in America, as we treat our favorite sports team. Now, everybody knows I'm a Chief fan and Jayhawk fan. And, you know, I'm certainly, you know, have a passion about my sports teams, but uh, not to the point to where I would hate an on another church because I see them as if they're the Las Vegas Raiders or the Denver Broncos. But we tend in the body of Christ, we tend to treat other denominations that way. I know you've heard people say nasty things about Catholic people as if they are the, uh, you know, the again, the, the, the Las Vegas Raiders or, you know, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers or as if they are the, you know, North Carolina Tar Heels. <laughs> no, I'm not that bad. My baby's a tar heel. But again, this is our this is the attitude that you see in the body of Christ. But if we are all calling God our Father, then doesn't that mean that all those people connected to that Father are our brothers and sisters? That Muslim Capital Day. That was a day and an, and, and an opportunity to preach and share the gospel of Jesus Christ, not storm the stage, snatch a mic from a woman, and embarrass, you know, in, 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 in rough house, and then spew all this nationalistic foolishness that, that is rooted in myths. So again, once again, we, we find ourselves in this discussion about the church. And what is the church? Chapter 14, again, opens with this picture once again of this 144,000, as I've tried to outline. And, and we, 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 we have to ask ourselves, is, is Christ, if, as we read the book of Revelation, is Christ serious about the church? And I think the simple answer to that even if you you may not understand it, or someone non-born again would probably easily say, yes, he is serious about the church. But then are we serious about the church and what is church? Are we serious about our version of it, of what is church? One of those questions that um, our senior hall used to say, questions that make you go, hmm. I came across a book, um, this uh, past week uh, that literally has this as the title. Uh, it says, title here, as you see it here, says, what if Jesus was serious about the church? And it's by Arthur uh, and pastor by the name of Sky Jitani. Uh, Sky Jitani, um, I actually met him, not in person, but I know him from um, the uh, Holy Post podcast. If you ever heard of Phil Vischer, Phil Vischer is the guy that um, developed the VeggieTales uh, series. Uh, he is the creator of this particular uh, podcast, and Scott Dutani is the co-host on the uh, show itself. And of course, as I mentioned, this is his latest book. And so I've only read the first part of the first chapter, but it's a really, um, you know, intriguing book. But in this book, he asks the question, you know, how do you define church? And again, this is related to Revelation chapter 14, since that's what the letter, that particular chapter of the letter is about once again. Um, how do you define church? And he actually lists four different ways we tend to define church, um, you know, today. Uh, one, most people, our people define church as, as a building. Uh, 
uh, in the sense of, hey, um, you know, the actual structure, um, you know, now as of right now, we don't have a church building where we meet regularly. We do have a building though. It's an office. You know, we have to keep that um, for the tax code stuff. Uh, and secondly, um, it's defined as an event. Again, did you go to church on Sunday or did you go to church on Wednesday? Or did you go to the revival, you know, the church, you know, revival, da, da, da. So, so in that sense, we use it in that way modernly as well. And C, or a third way, uh, we, we tend to use the word church is speaking of an institution with its leaders and budgets. And again, the 501c3 RS Tasco sense of the word. And then finally, a fourth way that the word church is used today, it's used to identify a community, he goes on to say, of men and women and children redeemed by Christ living in the unity, uh, living in unity with one another. Now, which is the right definition of church? Which is the best way we should use the word church here? You know, uh, how, how, how would the world in general define church? You know, if I had to guess, the world would probably say more so building and organization. Of course, you hear a lot of, um, you know, certainly as the the religious right, so to speak, or conservative Christians, as it relates politically, evangelical voting bloc tends to align themselves uh, with the Republican Party. It seems as if the world generally says, hey, see the church as an organization. Hey, take away their 501c3 and, you know, tax the church and so on and so forth like that. Um, but, but biblically, how does the Bible define church? Well, certainly, as far as A is considered, uh, you know, a building as a church, the Bible not even one time ever refers to a physical structure as the church. In the early church, first century, second century, um, even up to the third century, we don't see buildings dedicated simply to meeting spaces for church activity. People tended to meet in homes and, you know, in other places, in open areas. And uh, the wife has visited some small home churches in uh, Cappadocia when she was in Turkey, was before we met. I guess we were crisscrossing in the air, we think. Um, but yeah, the Bible never defines church as a building, not even once. Uh, certainly, you know, <laughs> uh, the Bible never defines church as an event as far as a specific day that you actually go and meet that, hey, you know, hey, did you go to church? You know, and certainly there is a, the verse, I want to say it's in Hebrew somewhere about, you know, forsake not the assembling of yourselves and you see the day approaching again. That's some stuff. That's it. That is part of a verse that's kind of taken out of context. Again, you know, the more important thing about the assembling of yourselves was the provoking one another to love and to good works. So regardless of what day you do that, you know, that's something we should do all the time, provoke one another. And not, it was not used as a specific day set apart. And then organizational wise, certainly in the first church, I mean, uh, in the early church, certainly as, Ro as the Roman empire was kind of in control of everything, you know, Christianity was pretty much outlawed. <laughs> You know, not as long as it seemed to be part of Judaism, it was, you know, more so uh, accepted by the Roman government. But as it began to distinguish itself from Judaism, and of course, we talked about that when we looked at uh, Nero uh, and some of the other uh, uh, emperors of, uh, of uh, Rome, of the Roman Empire, you know, hey, it began to be outlawed. And even we read some of those, uh, we probably didn't do it on Sunday, but we talked about plenty of the younger or, or plenty of the elder, I think it was plenty, who's writing to Tragen about, hey, uh, questioning Christians and making them denounce their uh, faith and putting them to, to death if they, you know, didn't swear, you know, allegiance to, um, you know, the emperor and, and whatnot. And so that leaves us with D, is that the way the Bible truly defines at every single turn, at every single opportunity in scripture, when it talks about the church, it is referring to brothers and sisters united in Christ, living in union with each other. So this is the way the Bible defines church. 
that it is a family, that it, it is a community. Would you define it in any other way? Anybody, any other comments? Would anyone, how would you define church? Or, you know, Jesus, he, you know, said to his, to his disciples, you know, who you say that I am kind of saying the same thing to you. Who do you say, what do you say is the church? Go ahead. So I have a question. Right the Bible never mentions an actual building for the church. Uh-huh. We're reading Exodus right now in Bible study. Mm -hmm. Everything I've read has been, this is the church. This is how we want it. We want this at the end of the table. We want this at the, the left side with a, with a stake in the ground. How is that not the building of the church? Okay, so yeah, that's a great question. So we're reading in Exodus and we're in uh, Exodus 25-ish, 30-ish in there, where it's talking about the building of the tabernacle. Uh, which was a sacred space where, um, you know, the children of Israel, as it expressed in what we call Judaism, uh, would come and present gifts and, you know, the, the temple system. Um, in that sense of, you know, for lack of a better word, church, that, that's not the same thing as church, as we do it. And that was a sacred space. This is what God had outlined in the Old Testament as far as how their worship was supposed to be centered around here, but, but centered around him. But as we get into the New Testament, we actually find the destruction of the temple. The temple is gone. There are no sacred spaces and God has never reordained a specific sacred structure that we need to gather around and build and bring our, you know, offerings, uh, you know, harvest and animals and sacrifice them too in, th in the New Testament or in the New Covenant. So uh, the temple is really a, a very culturally situated, you know, institution or cultural situated, situated entity. And again, once Jesus has, uh, you know, prophesied and said, hey, in Matthew chapter 24, that not one stone will be left standing upon the other. He, he was he was talking about the destruction of the temple. And, you know, in 23 and 22, he talks about, you know, the uh, uh, the disciples, not the disciples, excuse me, but the, um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, you know, the temple system, all that stuff. He said, man, you guys are brood of vipers. You have made my father's house a den of thieves. You know, it was supposed to be this house of prayer for all people. Again, multicultural, multi, but it's not that now. So I'm going to tear it down. And, you know, but of course, you know, you have people in dispensationalism says, hey, we need to rebuild a new, a third temple. And then after that one's get destroyed again, then Jesus will come back. But again, there's some, some faulty, you know, logic and lazy thinking there. But again, we cannot equate the tabernacle. And again, in, in the presence of God dwelling within that tabernacle to what we see in the modern day church. Again, we have tried to do that. We have made church buildings sacred. We've tried to make those sacred spaces. But that's not something the Bible tells us that we need to do in a modern sense. I hope that answered your question. Any follow-up question or rebuttal or pushback you want to go with at all? No, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. So basically, just to repeat, once Jesus died for us, there was no no need for something like that. Yeah. Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That we are the living stones. That 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 is the people. That is these people picturing here holding hands. This is the temple now. This this is we embody, we we are where the holy again, he's been shed abroad in our hearts. You know, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Again, we don't have need for, for the high priest in that sense and for someone to be a mediator between us and God. And, uh, you know, where we, um, you know, now nothing wrong with people having buildings today. I mean, again, culturally, that's, that's, that's what we do now. But you can spend all your church life in service to an organization and not have community. You can spend your entire life going to church every Sunday and not have community. You can spend your wheels making sure that the church is clean and that the windows are stained glass and that every older saint that has passed on has a pew named after him and you still not have community. This is what the church is supposed to be. 
This is the message and this is the context of what John keeps pointing to in this 144,000 that, hey, they're losing their lives at times. They are preaching and sharing the gospel, but hey, sometimes the enemy can, you know, throw them into prison. Or if you were to be killed with the sword, this is a 13, 15 or so, uh, 13, 15, that even though you were thrown into prison, you know, those who are being committed to prison shall be committed to prison. Those who are supposed to be killed with the sword, they shall be killed with the sword. Here is the faith and the patience of the saints that, that despite everything that goes on around us, we can still have the community. We should still have the community. And then as we see other parts of the community struggling, then we then reach out and help to lift up even them. And if we can't get to them, then it is through prayer and, and, and making our supplication to God that we then build the body, that we have been knit together in love. That's not a building. That's not a day of the week. And that's certainly not the organizational structure and the hierarchies that we tend to see in church. But it, it is to be a community. And again, how we see church really determines how we read the book of Revelation. If we read that 144,000 again as someone other than us who God simply left behind and hopefully they get it, oh, well, that's not community. This is what church is supposed to be. And that's how Revelation chapter 14 opens up with another picture of the church. Let's look at it real quick here. We finally made it to 14. Oh my goodness, okay. And, and in the future, as we go through this as well, we'll come back more to this ideal of what church should be and, and what this community should be. And again, nothing wrong with a, a church building, nothing wrong with someone being called pastor or an evangelist or sister or missionary or Sunday school or any of those things. A lot of those things, we're going to find out that with church, the Bible does list out some things that absolutely should be. But then there's a lot of room for how that particular thing is administered. Whether you start a service with prayer or start a, a service with, a, with music or with communion every Sunday, the Bible really doesn't specify those particular things. So again, a lot of that is just culturally and our particular, you know, methods or, you know, modus operandi. And again, it can't, it doesn't ha necessarily have to hinder the spirit. But it certainly it can if we let our tradition be the thing that kind of carries us through. But let's let's get a uh, verse uh, one here of chapter fourteen. And remember, we just came out of thirteen where we get this picture of the of the devil, you know, the serpent, the land beast, and the sea beast, or the you know the devil, the the antichrist, and the false prophet. And he says, verse one. And so now, so now we're going to get a different picture here, which I think is great. And he says, and I looked. So John had, you know, kind of been seeing this land, this, this beast coming out of the sea and this dragon with seven heads and this, this big behemoth like thing. And it's, you know, he's kind of only, you know, seeing this ground level. All of a sudden he's flung back to, it says Mount Zion. It says, and, and I looked, or just kind of like uh, it reads in the book of Daniel, Hane or behold, uh, and lo, a lamb on the Mount of Zion or Zion. And with him, a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So we have Jesus on Mount Zion. Of course, Mount Zion, you know, so we marching up to Zion. This is basically uh, the hill that the, that the ancient city of Jerusalem is built upon. This is also known as the mountain of God at times or the place of God in our Bibles as well, uh, the home of God. Uh, and of course, he's joined with this 144,000, which we've seen three or four other times in the uh, text leading up to this point. I think this is, this is maybe the third or fourth. I can't remember exactly. I have to go back and count them for next week. Uh, but they have this having his father's name written in their foreheads. We talked a lot about the mark of the beast in the previous weeks. And we also talked about the 144,000 being marked. Again, this is a picture, I think, that's also in the book of uh, Zechariah as well. It's uh, 
or is it Ezekiel? Anyway, we talked about in Exodus about the phylactery, the thing that shows devotion. So again, this 144,000, they have the father's name written in their foreheads. They, this is a family. And of course, as I've been arguing, this is a picture of the people of God, a symbolic number of the people of God, not just the 144,000 that got saved during the tribulation. Um, and it says that, look what they're doing. They, uh, they stood, and though a lamb stood on the Mount of, 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 of Zion and with him. So this, this 144,000 or this, this, again, when we first see this number, 144,000, it said that it, John says he hears these 12 tribes, 1,000, 12,000 from each of these 12 tribes being called. But when he turns and looks and sees, <clears throat> excuse me, when he turns and looks and sees, he says this army was so vast that he could not count it. No one could count it. It was so many people. It was made up again of every tribe, tongue, and nation. And here they are standing. And this word stood here, as I looked it up in the Greek, it literally is, is kind of stood almost, it seems, in a militaristic sense, that this is that army that we've read before. And they are standing with uh, the Lamb of God. Verse 2. And I heard a voice, excuse me, <clears throat> from heaven as the voice of many waters and the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And so he hears this loud cacophony of noises and, you know, it sounds like rushing water. It sounds like, you know, a great thunder cracking, rumbling, so to speak. And he hears harpers stringing and stuff like that. Um, now, I remember at the beginning of a uh, concert when I played when I played uh, cello in a uh, middle school and high school of course we would have this warm up and of course everyone is you know tuning their instruments and you kind of hear this this giant cacophony of sound and you really can't make out anything maybe someone is running down a scale and maybe someone over here is playing uh you know uh something by Jodeci on a clarinet or something like that but it's just all this sound kind of just bustling together and then verse three, it says, and they sung as it were a new song before the throne. And so he hears even people beginning to sing as well. You got all this noise, and but you can make out someone is singing as well. Possibly it seemed like, like the rehearsal, he goes on to say, they're singing before a new song before the throne and before the four beasts. We talked about the four beasts uh, going around the throne and the elders, the 24 elders. And no man could learn the song, but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. So you have all this noise, you have these harps and instruments playing, and you have these people kind of stirring and beginning to sing, and uh, you have this, but, but, and no one can really make out or learn the song except this, this redeemed people from the earth, which is, again, the 144,000. This is why I say this is the people of God. This is what we, aka now, call the church. Now, we're actually going to see in the next chapter where there's actually a song being sung that we can actually make out with words and stuff like that. Verse 4. These, these people that could hear this 144,000, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. All right. So I've been arguing this 144,000 represents the people of God, really what we you know, know as the church. Uh, and again, I'm not one that teaches that, you know, the church is snatched out and taken to heaven in some type of rap secret rapture event. Because again, that's not something we've come across in the book of Revelations. That's something that people tend to read into the text. But, it, but the 144,000, the church is always in the world. As long as until Jesus says, hey, it's time. The church is here. 
supposedly working and, 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 and calling people to repentance and, and preaching the gospel. But he goes on to say here um, that these, these particular 144,000, these are they which are not the five women, for they are virgins. Now, and again, in, in a dispensational sense, they will try to read this the most literalistic way they can, that, hey, if you are not a virgin, then this is not you. This is why they don't see this as the church, and another reason why, because, well, you know, church people, you know, there's maybe some virgins in there, but, you know, the rest of us are heathens, have been heathens or something to that, you know what I mean? And we, we may have gotten forgiven, but nonetheless, we are certainly not virgins. But what we have to understand here, this is, we're talking about an army of God here, this 144,000. And so in the Old Testament, within the Old Testament, when it talks about not being defiled with women and that these people are, are clean, we're talking about in a very uh, ritualistic clean. Before you went to battle, you literally had to uh, abstain from sexual intercourse with women. Remember, if you uh, recall in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, I'll, I'll give you this particular verse here, Deuteronomy 23, 9 through 10. It literally says that when the host goeth forth against their, thine enemy, so when it's time to go to war, then keep thee every from every wicked thing. So if they wanted you to be ritually clean. So remember the sin of Achan uh, in the book of uh, is it Joshua? When they during the conquest, he actually steals, and of course, because he was ritually unclean, because he had taken the, the unclean thing and hit it, Israel ended up losing the next battle at Ai. That same ideal is here in the book of Deuteronomy that when the host goeth against thine enemies, keep thee from every wicked thing. If there be among you any man that is not clean by reason of uncleanness, that uh, uh, chancing it uh, by him by night, then shall he go abroad out of the camp. He shall not come within the camp. So literally, if you are not ritually clean, then hey, we need you to go away because you are going to cause us, you're going to defile the entire community. And that, that could be disastrous for us in war. So that's what's going on here. And also, you can read the same thing in uh, 1 Samuel 21, uh, 21 and 5. This is the example of when David literally goes with his men before he is king. He's running from Saul and they are hungry. And he literally goes to the temple and he asks for the, 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 the showbread. And what did the priest say to him? Hey, have you guys kept yourselves from your wives? And they're like, yeah. And so then the priests are then able to feed them the uh, showbread that would have been eaten by the priest within the tabernacle, within the, the temple itself, where um, there was no temple at the time within the tabernacle. And so you can also find the same, and they're the example of this ritual cleanness that he is pointing to in a militaristic sense in 2 Samuel 11, 8 through 11. So, so this is what's being pointed here. Not that people are literally have been virgins all their, their lives. And that that's the only way you can be in this 144,000. But again, remember I keep saying that the best way to understand our 66 book of the Bible is to have a good understanding of the previous 65 books. So that, that's what's going on here. He says, so these which are not defiled women for they are virgins, for they, for these are they which follow the lamb wheresoever he go. Isn't that what the church is supposed to do? That when he moves, we move just like that? These were redeemed. As ludicrous as that Jesus. I'm going to say it's Jesus. Anyway, these are the redeemed from among men. Anybody been redeemed? Right. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, baby. That's right. I got people here in my mind. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed, yes. And we know who we were. We know what we were. We know our shortcomings. We know the testament. We know how far in darkness we were. Uh, some of us that they said they had to pump in daylight. We know that about ourselves. And he says that these are being the first fruits unto God and the Lamb. When we look in the Old Testament at the um, first fruits, um, and I have this in my notes as far as the scripture reference to it, um, but I'll just say this and then wrap up. But when we look at the first fruits, the children of Israel, when they would come into the land, 
and the tabernacle was built and everything is established. They were supposed to, the very first harvest, they were so, before they harvested anything for themselves, they were supposed to take a basket, didn't say how large the basket was, but simply a basket and bring some of the first shoots from the first grains and things from their harvest to God. This is, would be the smallest harvest, but they are not bringing literally harvesting everything and bringing it all to God as far as the first root. That tends to be how the least the church circles I've grown up in uh, tend to define first fruits. Uh, and when we would try to practice a for, give a first fruit offering, many times what it meant was, okay, I've gotten a new job. And so I'm going to give my first fruit offering. I literally take my paycheck, the whole entire paycheck, and then I sign it over to the church as a first fruit. But that's not how first fruits work in the Bible. The first fruit was just a portion of, it was the first portion of the harvest. But again, it said, literally, you put it in a basket. You can't get, again, the Bible doesn't specify how big the basket was, but again, it was supposed to be representative of, Lord, because you have blessed us and you will continue to bless us, I am going to give you this. And really, that first fruit often really pretty much represented the entire thing. But literally, you were not harvesting your whole first harvest and then dragging it off to the tabernacle. That's not really what was happening. And so there's some misunderstanding as it relates to tithing and giving in the New Testament, or at least in the modern church today. Go ahead. Uh, between um, Cain and Abel, and mm -hmm. when God didn't accept uh, Cain's sacrifice, mm -hmm. this not accepted because it didn't have the like a blood covering. What, you know, what are you uh, I mean, I, I don't particularly know because certainly, you know, as, as offerings are related, sometimes green, you know, grains and harvested items are certainly an acceptable offering and certainly blood or animal sacrifice is an accepted thing. So the Bible really doesn't tell us specifically. There's a lot of, you know, conjecture in, you know, like Jewish commentaries, the Targums and the Mishnah, stuff like that about what went wrong. But all of it is conjecture uh, from what we can tell from the biblical text is that, hey, his heart, something was wrong with his heart. And that's as far as I'm willing to go myself with as far as why his offer is not accepted, you know, and yeah. not necessarily the particular items that he that he he brought over there. Now, maybe if I come across some other information, my, I, my thought will change on it, but that's where I kind of stand right now. But anyway, this 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 first fruits, you know, he says that, that these were redeemed from among men, these being first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. This is really a sense of, you know, the entirety of the whole, just like it would be in the first fruit offering. Even though it's not everybody for all time, again, as long as the earth remains, as long as it keeps spinning, as long as Christ has not returned, then you know, we we are all part of this kind of first fruit. The people of God is kind of embodied in this first fruit. And so, um, and again, it goes on to say, talks again, their purity here. And in their mouth was found no God, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, what we're going to get next, and we'll, we'll get into this next week as I wrap up here, is that we're going to get these three pronouncements by angelic um, heralds, so to speak. And these, 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 the very first one that's going to be found in verse six, again, it's going to be another message about the church and about the preaching of the word of God. And again, that's something that has been given to us as the people of God to do and not to any other entity. That is our job. That is our mission to be part of this harvesting of souls. And really the book, the, excuse me, not the book, but the uh, chapter itself ends on this image of harvest, a reaping that we'll need to talk about as well. So uh, let me stop it there and open the floor for questions, uh, comments. Let me stop the recording. Uh, more.